Good afternoon, everyone. Let's just give uh, 30 more seconds for everyone just to come in uh, before we get started. Oh, quite quite large numbers of people dialing in. That's excellent. Hot topic. Hot topic indeed. Okay, I think I think we've got enough now. Some more more people come in, but it's good to get started. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. If you have not met me be before, my name's Gordon Ross. I'm managing director of the Enterprise Group at Dynasty, uh, and I'm delighted to bring to you guys the next instalment of practice management webinars that we're bringing to the Dynasty Network. Um, when we're picking topics for these webinars, we're always looking for things that we think are timely or important to the network, but also areas where you perhaps aren't able to get some of this source material in you know the the open market and open available and and I think today is a, a really good example of this um we're talk we're going to be talking about charitable planning uh really doing a deep dive into all the various tools and resources that are open to RIAs um and helping their clients on the charitable front um and we think this is very timely uh, for a conversation. Not only are we now in Q4, we're getting towards the end of the year. Obviously, that's the time of year when many clients are doing gifting. Um, but just from an industry level, I think uh, one of the things that we're seeing across the network is more and more advisors are really beginning to lean into this area of charitable and philanthropic planning. Um, it really appears to be one of those kind of value add services um, the advisors are, are really using to build client, build client relationships and build stickiness with clients. So it's definitely an area we get uh, plenty of questions on. Um, I'm delighted to be joined uh, by a number of extremely qualified guests. Um, in particular, we wanted to introduce um, invite guests from the three custodian partners uh, that uh, that the network co works with, Schwab, Fidelity, and Pershing. Um, and uh, what's excellent is all three of these firms have built out excellent resources and uh, tools and, and expertise in this area. And so in many cases, if, if we have an advisor um, that is asking questions around uh, the charitable planning world, we always say, you know, speaking to your custodian, first of is, is a really good kind of first port of call. Um, so I'm delighted to be joined by, first of all, we'll go with ladies first. We have Julia Reid from Schwab Charitable. Uh, Julia's uh, been at Schwab for 17 years and she works with uh, not only nationwide firms, but also family offices across the country um, on, on the topic of, of philanthropy. Uh, we're all, we also have Sh Sharia Kirk, from Pershing Philanthropic Solutions. Uh, Shari has been at Pershing for over 25 years and working with a, a number of the different donor advice fund sponsors uh, available in the industry. Um, and last but not least, we definitely have Jim, Car uh, Jim Carpenter from Fidelity Charitable. Uh, Jim is part of, I believe, an eight-person team uh, at Fidelity, which is, I think, one of the biggest teams in the industry coming out of the uh, Great Lakes region. Uh, but that team works with uh, RIAs up and down the country. Uh, Sharia, Julia, Jim, great to see you. Thank you so much for being on here today. Thanks for having Thank us. for having us. So I wanted to start off with a little bit of uh, a kind of a... a almost a kind of like refresh our course a little bit in the tools that advisors have uh, at their uh, at their in at their use at the custodians for example you know i used to work for a multifamily office and and uh, owning like things like donor advised funds was very much kind of standard operating procedure for for pretty much all clients in those days because of an this is maybe because of the kind of breakaway from the warehouses we're still finding um some firms that are still relatively new to the donor advised fund world uh, and still fairly new to the resources that the custodians have to offer um so jim i think it'd be good just just as a kind 
kind of brief kind of interlude. It'd just be good just to see like what what are can you just give a brief overview of like how donor advice funds work, the the benefits of them, and how advisors can typically work with uh, with them to really help their clients. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, Gordon, and thanks everybody for dialing in today. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, the donor advice fund in particular. And then over the course of the rest of the time, we'll talk about sort of charitable planning in a larger sense. Um, the donor advice fund, the best way to think about it is a donor advice fund is an account at a large public charity, sort of an administrative account at a large public charity. And what that enables the financial advisor or the advice team to do is have the conversation around the client's philanthropy and they can they make the gift to this large public charity. In today's conversations, Schwab Charitable is a large public charity. Pershing has a couple of different avenues of their own charity and some other relationships. Fidelity Charitable is a large public charity. So when the gift goes to, at that moment, the gift goes to a large public charity, that is the moment of the tax deduction for the client. So they have cleared the, uh, what is often a key hurdle, particularly for wealthy clients, that they've achieved their tax deduction status. They've made a gift to a public charity. But at the donor advised fund, now we're in the position of the title, the donor advice. And what the donor advised fund public charities do is hold, you know, in many cases, several thousand accounts, thousands of accounts, awaiting the donor's advice on two key fronts. The main one we talk about is what charities would you and, and your family like to support? What charities are doing the activities or doing the work that's important to you and your family? Please tell us and we will send them checks. And your donor advised fund sponsor becomes, you know, we're all in this business of the, the largest transaction processors on the planet for sending checks to charities. For example, Fidelity this year will send a couple million checks out to various charities. It's it's a crazy transaction processor. Um, the second uh, part of the donor advice fund, the second piece of donor advice is how would you like these funds invested in the meantime, right? So that's the second piece of donor advice, and all the donor advice fund sponsors have various avenues for that: uh, a collection of in-house investments. And then uh, uh, certainly in this group, a uh, collection of your larger accounts can advise the donor to hire you as the RIA to manage the funds on behalf of the donor advice fund alongside the funds that you manage for the family on their regular accounts. So in a planning context, what you get with the donor advice fund, like with other charitable vehicles, is the ability to have a great conversation with your clients and their families about what's really important and then be able to move that conversation and break the chain between their charitable planning and their charitable beneficiaries. So the donor advised fund gives you a place that you can do it in the context of tax planning and portfolio planning and spreadsheet work in which we are all comfortable with as financial advisors, separate from whether the Girl Scouts or the World Food Kitchen is their most important charity. And the, the donor advised fund gives you a, an intermediate step to accomplish their planning separate from the mission-y, vision-y part about what's the most important to them. So that's where we live in the donor advice fund. From a from a simplicity standpoint, all of you, all of the custodians have a system where you can push the button right at your client account, open a donor advice fund. It's super easy. It's not a standalone legal entity. It's an account at a large public charity that often has a similar software system to the one you're working on with your client accounts, and so it becomes very easy and inexpensive to operate rather than uh, other charitable vehicles, which might be appropriate, but they're gonna take some setup. I'm sure we'll touch on those. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Jim, for doing that. Yeah, it's been it's been fascinating to see like the industry over the last 10 years, this kind of involvement and evolution and really innovation uh, on this front. And and we're definitely going to touch on a number of these topics uh, in terms of what's available to to adv advisors, because, you know, 10 years ago, or maybe going back further, you know, the, the concept of like foundations and things like that, where the left solely for the ultra high uh, high net worth and 
great uh, fast forward to today where really you know many families should think about these kind of charitable um uh, charitable solutions julia what are you guys seeing at schwab particularly like okay so we've we've uh, kind of going past kind of donor advice funds where maybe we've got a bit more of kind of complex gifting situations and uh, and maybe somebody's looking to gift like multiple different types of assets like what are you guys seeing on on shops front well you mentioned that donor advised funds have grown particularly in the past decade i think um they certainly have become the vehicle of choice and the even more and more every year, particularly for the next generation. I think part of the reason for that is just the ease of use that Jim mentioned and the integration and advisors like the ones that are joining us today, having the conversation with their clients. But one thing that is also unique about donor advised funds um, is that we really, we accept more than half of the assets that we accept at Schwab Charitable, for example, and I'm sure the same is true for my colleagues are non-cash. And so you see nearing 400 billion going to charity every year. When that's given directly, it, it's more often than not cash. But when a donor is funding a vehicle, they're often using publicly traded securities um, that they've held longer than one year because they get a double benefit, potentially because they're avoiding capital gains on the sale of the appreciated asset, um, as well as being able to itemize the deduction. Now, I think also it's, I'd be remiss in not mentioning that we are facing some market volatility. And so sometimes the conversation with a high net worth client around giving appreciated assets can be awkward, um, mm -hmm. especially if they don't have any. Um, so sometimes in that conversation, we even at times like this, you wanna look as far across the balance sheet as possible. And it may not always be publicly traded securities. Um, it could be uh, any pre-liquidity situation, a, a client that is getting ready to sell a business, um, they are holding on to second home or real estate. These are all examples of not more non-traditional, non-publicly traded assets that can be gifted directly to charity, including to donor advised funds. And the, the providers that you have here on the call have in-house expertise in doing due diligence on these assets, which makes all of your jobs very easy. As long as you can suss out the opportunity, you contact us and we help you determine the viability of that gift to the donor advised fund. So your client gets the tax deduction, they potentially also avoid a capital gains tax bill on the sale of the asset. They then have a pool of philanthropic assets that they can give out of the account while you manage the investments and potentially even charge a fee. So um, I think it's still definitely a, a conversation, a very relevant conversation to have with clients and around non-cash in general. Um, that said, most of what we accept is publicly traded securities because it's very easy to Jim's point, it's all integrated so they can just do a journal of appreciated assets from their brokerage account into their donor advice fund. Um, the other, and Jim touched on this a little bit and we may talk a little bit more about it in a bit, but the other trend that we talk a lot about is the use of multiple vehicles. So mm -hmm. even though we're all here to talk about donor advised funds or at least showcase them, um, our donors really typically are using more than one uh, mechanism to fund charities. So they may be giving directly, they may be taking advantage of the qualified charitable distribution. Um, they may also be using a private foundation, particularly as you, as you get north of 20 million in net worth, they may have a foundation, they may have a donor advised fund at more than one provider, they may be working with the community foundation. So we really try to stress that the vehicles are not mutually exclusive. It's really about what the goals of the donor are, what the asset is, um, what works best from, for, for them. And we work with advisors to try to sort of determine that through conversation and planning. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, and we definitely want to get onto some of those additional kind of tools and resources um, and solutions uh, later on in the conversation. Shadia, j j just as we're kind of going into year end, what are kind of like the best practices and the strategies and the deadlines that like an advisor should have at the front of their mind right now as we go into the final couple of months of the year? Sure. So, well, we have Thanksgiving coming up, uh, I guess it's next week already. So I think you mentioned, Gordon, you know, the, the family component of charitable giving. So what a great time when families might be together um, over the next month or so uh, to 
reconnect on this? You know, if they already have a donor advised fund, are their grants still in line with their family values? Mm -hmm. Are those that are in the family that want to be involved, involved? Or maybe some have been, uh, it's time to look at, you know, succession plan too. Are those that are named as successor donors willing to act in that capacity? And are they aligned with, you know, what's important to the family? Mm -hmm. um, have they been making grants this year or contributions this year? So for example, um, maybe it's a high income year for them. They, you know, they're, they're looking at their marketable security saying, well, don't have a lot of appreciated assets, but it is a high income year. So maybe they consider something like bunching. So there they can make a large contribution this year that will give them a tax benefit, but then spread those grants over years. So that mm -hmm. might be one, one um, strategy to think of. Um, involving younger members of the family in the grant process. You know, um, I always uh, tell stories about a, a friend who involved their kids in recommending grants. You know, hey, everybody, what should we give to this year? And hmm. now those kids, you know, have grown up with kind of a philanthropic focus. So that can be really great. If they don't have a donor advised fund, you know, you mentioned at the beginning that there's still a lot of people that are not familiar with donor advised funds. And I find that all the time, talking to advisors, talking to my friends. Um, and so what a great time for everyone as an, as an advisor to bring that up, show that value, connect with the family on the topic. Even if they start out just with a, a small contribution, most donor advised funds have either low minimums or no minimums. Um, and so they can tip their toe in there. And then that gives you as the advisor, a great opportunity to connect with them, you know, midway through the year and connect not only with the, your current client, but with the, with their heirs. So with the kids, with the next generation. And then lastly, at this time of year, of course, um, deadlines. Deadlines will be coming up soon. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, you know, the donor advised fund sponsor has to receive those assets by 1231. Or if it's a check, it has to be postmarked by the US post office, not UPS, not FedEx, by the 31st. Um, so those deadlines are important to think about. So that's an amazingly useful, Shadi, and, and it reminds me, um, we're going to be sending out following uh, this webinar, a kind of info pack of you, the three people on this call have been really generous in terms of like information uh, that they've given to Dynasty in terms of like deadlines and, and kind of procedures and things like that. We're going to be sending that out following today's webinar. Um, and I should also mention for we're now getting into the point where in the in the section where we're going to have some Q and A towards the end of of the webinar. If anybody wants to ask any questions, you can do it by just uh, typing into the chat function in Zoom. So f please feel free to type into there, and we'll do our best to kind of get to all the questions um, towards the end. But so huge thank you to the three of you to really kind of setting the scene here. I am I really want to kind of move move beyond this and, and move beyond you know the traditional kind of donor advised fund structure because I had all three of the organizations here on the call there's been some real innovation over the last couple of years and, and frankly investment um, around the resources that are available to advisors so Sharia can you just from a Persian point of view just give a I, I'd be really interested to hear like what do you guys kind of offer now in terms of uh, maybe perhaps like less traditional offerings at Pershing? Um, sure so you know, I think the focus has definitely been on donor advised funds, especially for the past few years. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on that in a moment, just in a little bit more depth. But we also offer access to charitable trust solutions. Um, there are certainly clients that have foundations that can open accounts at Pershing. Um, you know, we're custodian, so have plenty of non not-for-profit accounts. Um, from a charitable trust standpoint, what we do is we have what we call our trust network, which gives our clients access to a selection of six different corporate trustees. And those, those corporate trustees can act for charitable trusts, uh, what, delegating then investment management to the advisor. So that advisor managed, you know, advisor charges a fee, uh, advisor is essentially hired by the by the trust 
the trust company to manage those assets. Um, so we have a lot of activity there. And then for clients that are establishing at a charitable trust but don't want a corporate trustee, uh, Renaissance uh, Ren, now known as, um, does administration for charitable trusts. So we see a, a bit of that. Again, it's advisor managed accounts at Pershing because Renaissance doesn't manage money. And then on the donor advised fund front, it's really a matter of choice as well. Of course, any donor advised fund that could cust can custody at Pershing, and there are lots, could, could open an account with you. But we have focused on three, uh, primarily because that's uh, those are the ones that are of interest to our clients. Um, you might know we're owned by the Bank of New York Mellon. And so we have our own proprietary donor advised fund, the BNY Mellon Charitable Gift Fund. But there the assets are managed by BNY Mellon NA. So no advisor management opportunity, but certainly a, a value add in some cases. And then two, American Endowment Foundation and Renaissance Charitable Foundation that um, are donor advised fund sponsors that don't manage assets. So there you can use their services as, as, as Jim, you so eloquently outlined then the donor advised fund sponsor is essentially hiring you to manage the assets that were given to them and opening an account at Pershing to do so. Got it, excellent uh, for that. Julia, what about at Schwab? You guys have launched a number of uh, things over the last kind of 24 months. What, what, what are some of the additional resources open to advisors? Yeah, I think um, over the course of my career, I've, I know I've learned well that advisors like uh, variety and selection. <laughs> um, and um, we have team a team that's positioned really geographically so that they can be if you're willing to invite them in, be your resource, your dedicated resource on all things charitable planning. So really air traffic control, regardless of the vehicle. So we know that ultra high net worth clients will have private foundations. They may have community fund foundations. They may have donor advised funds with um, a REN PSG or other provider. Um, we try to be very agnostic, but bring the resource to the advisor and to the donor so that they can make a decision about who they want to use for administration on those assets. So Schwab provides the custody, Schwab Charitable can provide the administration on the donor advised fund assets, but we also have other resources at Schwab to do trust administration, corporate trustee is offered by our trust services group, and there's another subject matter expert dedicated to that. So what we try to do is, depending on the need, direct you to the right place, sometimes that's a third party. Um, and in the case of, for instance, foundation services, we will sort of give you a selection from our network of providers that do that um, so that you can you know, make a decision about what's best for the client. And it may not be the same thing. In fact, very frequently, it's not the same thing for every client. So we really rely on all of you to have that more meaningful, deeper conversation with your clients to determine what's best for them. Um, so I would say that, yes, all of the above it depends on the specifics of the client situation, how we handle it. Um, and that's why we have these dedicated con charitable consultants across the country that have many firms and some of the folks probably on this call rely on them um, as their sort of their their dedicated subject matter expert on charitable planning because we can bring those resources to you you don't have to seek them out yourself excellent excellent thank you and jim from the fidelity side i i'd be interested to hear because you guys get you know uh through fidelity you know owns e-money and things like that you know just be interested to hear from the like the planning side and then from the distribution side of like fidelity's offering like what's available to advisors Oh, that's great. Uh, thanks for asking. And thanks for teeing it up that way, because that's really the way I want to talk about it, the way Fidelity Charitable supports the advisor practice or the, mm -hmm. you know, a, a multifamily office type practice where we really do have it divided into two sides. So um, on the contribution planning where we would be working with a financial advisor about, you know, we have a client, they're philanthropic, the family meeting is between now and Christmas, and we're going to work our way through. So we have our regional team of which I am part of, there's nine of us across the country to work directly with the independent advisors. 
And we, and we get those referrals from all sorts of ways. Surely we own e-money, so we get calls from the e-money desk. My client mm-hmm. wants to talk about it, owner advice owners. And so we have a team um, across the country to work with advisors and donors around the right asset at the right time, at the right price to fund their future in philanthropy. And we may, um, you know, we may be using, as Julia uh, talked about, um, illiquid or non-publicly traded assets to fund their philanthropy, you know, a piece of their real estate portfolio or a piece of the business, they're taking a private equity infusion, whatever that is. So we have this whole uh, ecosystem around planning the contribution side and setting up the family's philanthropic future. Some of it might be donor advised fund. That certainly we're all on the payroll for donor advised fund. So um, that's certainly where we go. But <clears throat> depending on what the family is contributing and what their future in philanthropy looks like, they may, you know, they may want to have a, a remainder trust associated with their DAF or a, a lead trust. They may want to do a private foundation. It's going to depend on how they're thinking about their future in philanthropy and how they're funding it and what's going to be the most appropriate. And that's my team to do that. And one of the ways we think about this with the families that many of your advisors work with is in a conversation or in an event like that, maybe they're having a liquidity event and they're selling the widget factory. We're going to be working with them to convert these families from donors. We know entrepreneurs are more generous than the the cross-section of the larger population. We're going to help convert them from donors to philanthropists Mm. with a P and that's a different group. And what we've built over the years at Fidelity Charitable is we have a separate regionally based team of eight or nine, I don't know, they keep hiring people, but there's like nine people in what we call our private donor group and they're teed up to work with the families and the advisors around the distribution side, you know, work on the value conversation for the funders, the G2s, the G3s, work on that conversation of what's gonna be important to them, irrespective of the vehicle. Just like, what is it that they're gonna to wanna to support and how is that gonna work? And, you know, get the, as, as Shadia referred to, you know, now we've got the kids online and they wanna send all the money to PETA and grandpa doesn't wanna send any money to PETA and sort of work through those conversations on the distribution side. And then what's gonna be the most appropriate vehicle? Do they send checks out of the DAF? Do they send checks out of the foundation? What's gonna be the most appropriate? And then, you know, that, that team has a back office for charitable research. So maybe the family figures out through the conversations that what's important to them is food security in their part of the country. Well, what charities are gonna use? So we'll fire up the research team to drill through, find two or three or four charities that hit their high points and then help them understand what questions to ask of the charity to dial it into how they're going to fund off into the future. So there really are two sides of the charitable planning. And one of the things we built is, you know, really two separate skill sets for funding versus distribution. So so you just mentioned how uh, your team will help the client find um, uh, charities that hit their high points. By that, do you mean... A specific criteria that the family has decided or like certain are they putting them through a certain like filter you know that's going to be determined sort of at the family level as part of that in in advisor language you know the fact finding meetings yeah. of, of what is it that is important so you, you do the, the values conversation you know we'll pick it in like you know childhood literacy programs and okay so what is our criteria is it going to be you know um challenged communities is it going to be affiliated mm-hmm. with personal prep school you know sort of sort of criteria and then our research team dial up charities that hit you know not all 10 of your hot buttons but maybe eight out of 10 of them in a different order and then uh, facilitate introductions to the directors of the charities so, and you, help with a visit and, and the, the, I, I this is kind of an open question for the the group uh, because i think this is something that many advisors are really trying to kind of steer into in today's world whereby they are that they're really providing that kind of like multi-generational 
planning where they're working with all the different layers of the family. And so if, if an advisor is doing that well, the, you, you're going to get to a point where the advisor is in a room with multiple generations and they're competing and they've got competing viewpoints. One generation wants to give it to one type of cause and one generation wants to give it to another type of cause. So question number one is like, how? what are some of the best practices that an advisor can do to kind of manage that situation? And then second of all, let's say you actually like figure out on the specific causes, how do you then... Are there any kind of best practices or tools or resources that an advisor can use to help kind of go through that kind of selection process? Jim, I know you mentioned that like Fidelity can help kind of filter that, uh, mm -hmm. but like what other kind of solutions are, what other kind of resources are there? So the, the two questions there for, for the group, like how do you manage that family dynamics? And then how do you manage the selection process? Open, open one for the group. Um, I can jump in. I think um, I'll start with the second question and then talk about the dynamics. I think every relationship you all know is very different and how you approach that conversation is going to depend on those dynamics, right? And also the personalities of the client and you all have become the trusted advisor, you know your clients best. So I don't know that there's a one size fits all approach to helping them work through what every family has in terms of dynamics. We do, our approach at Schwab Charitable is to develop tools to help you have that conversation regardless. Um, so for example, we've created, and some of these tools are available, they're all for free, but some of these are available also from third parties. Um, so if, again, selection, if you want to look at what's out there, I think we can give you some recommendations, but Schwab Charitable has created a giving guide um, and it's modular. Um, so things like finding your focus, um, there's actual tangible exercises that you can do to support that conversation. I find that it often helps to have some sort of anchor, right? If, even if it's a worksheet, right, that you're going through the, with the client as an exercise, it will loosen things up. Um, and you, so it's a twofer, right? You're actually crafting a charitable strategy, but you're also managing some of those family dynamics at the same time. So finding focus, there is certainly resources on vetting charities, evaluating charities once you've selected them. And we have a giving planner so that you can actually put together a plan that you can course correct and check in with. Um, and we have a guide to the guide specifically for advisors, like those of you on the call, how to use it. Um, the other thing is we're currently getting ready to release a selection of Nash of tools specifically for the multi-generational conversation and family dynamics. We've done this in partnership with the National Center on Family Philanthropy. So again, this is one of those third-party resources you could read all day and all night, all about the family dynamics questions. But these workbooks or these, these roadmaps or guides, as we're calling them, um, are there specifically to, to, for, for advisors to help address the family question around philanthropy? Um, do you want to give collectively? Are there some people that potentially want to do something different? Is that okay with you? How do you have that conversation? Have you even told the children about the wealth? There's a lot of, of um, you know, first G1, first generation founders that haven't even shared with their children how wealthy they are. Right. Um, and so that, you know, that's a starting point. So these are some, that's, those are some of the tools that we have to support the conversation. In terms of the family dynamics, I would refer back to the tools, um, but also trying to tap into empathy um, and, and seeing it from the client's perspective. Um, every family has dynamics um, and just trying to put yourself in their shoes, um, not judging their choices. Um, and I think that that will only deepen your relationship. I realize, though, it's for some advisors, it can be a sensitive topic um, and maybe out of their comfort zone. Um, but more, more like 99% of the time, I've only seen it good, do good things for relationships. Um, just asking questions is a good starting point. Excellent. Excellent. Jim or Shada, anything to add in there? Well, I'd take a, a plunge right back in. And as, uh, as, Julia mentioned, you know, clearly the advisors are going to own this relationship and they built it over the years. Um, but when you get to, you know, the family, the multi-generational family conversation, individual families have their own dynamics and all of us as advisors have our own path that we've arrived at that conversation. So we may or may not be comfortable 
with that, uh, both managing that dynamic and asking hard questions. So at the advisor level, you know, speaking, you know, let's you know, speaking for Fidelity Charitable, what we built is uh, sort of layers of systems to help the advisor as appropriate. So we have our regionally based team who will come to the family meeting and they're skilled psychologists. They will come and manage that and, you know, work with the advisor to help the family get to that if they're not, you know, personally, you know, prone to those sort of hard questions. So we're happy to consult on that. We're, um, but a lot of advisors, you know, they're perfectly willing to take care of the tools and take a stab at it and own it. And, and they're fine. We're happy to support that. And then our team does more of a back office and technical support for whatever their granting is. The third layer, and I haven't really mentioned it, but the other thing that we built at Fidelity and, and our lawyers don't like me to talk about it because it's over on the for-profit side of Fidelity, but we've built a thing called Fidelity Philanthropic Consulting, where recently uh, I know that some advisor teams in my uh, territory have hired, got to pay them, hired Fidelity Philanthropic Consulting to come in and train the advisors on how to do those conversations, essentially pirate the skill set from our private donor group and train the advisor team on how to be better and more comfortable having those conversations. Mm -hmm. So, we, you know, it's really we're here uh, to support the advisor community at whatever comfort level they have. If they want to, you know, self-train, you know, like Schwab, like Pershing, work, Fidelity, we got plenty of tools you can train yourself. But when you want to call in a consultant, call us <laughs> because, you know, that team will show up and help you through that. Then you do that a couple of times. Then you're, then you got the drill down, you know, about the values cards and the tests and the conversation, then you, you get better at it. Right. So all of those things have evolved over the years. Excellent. Thank you. Shadi, anything from you? Um, yeah, I mean, we don't directly provide consulting. That's not our area, but the donor advised fund sponsors that we do, Mm -hmm. we work with certainly do and you know going back to your point julia with the tools um american endowment foundation for example they have a newsletter that has lots of tips um uh they they have a consultant ken nopar who's a very frequent writer there was a, he wrote an article in uh, wealth management last week i think um so certainly resources available through whether it be Amer be american endowment renaissance or the bny mellon charitable gift fund um um, you know, and, and I'm sure they have a lot of experience in dealing with those fa family dynamic challenges and, you know, they're there as resources as well to help. Good stuff. Good stuff. Just a reminder, guys, we've got about probably about 10, 15 minutes left in the webinar. So if you've got any questions, by all means, kind of uh, uh, type them in at, at the bottom there on the chat function. Um, another kind of open, uh, open question to the panel. One of one of the things that we find an awful lot with dynasty network firms is um, I, an awful lot of the end clients of network firms are um, are you know first I, I, are are wealthy for the first time. There's an awful lot of kind of business owners and and people who have. But, uh, who have built their own wealth, who are the end clients of dynasty network firms. Um, why that, uh, uh, compared to like inherited wealth and, and everything like that, why that is, I'm, I'm sure somebody smarter than I will, will figure that out. But in terms of kind of just best practices around when you're dealing with maybe uh, a business owner or, or, uh, a, or maybe like a high level CC executive, some of the best practices around kind of charitable giving uh, and just kind of tying this in with the whole kind of financial planning process, I think I, I think is really important. Any any kind of best practices or pointers from the group? I think so. go ahead, Jim. Well, I was gonna I was gonna jump in and say you're you're great to bring that up because you know fidelity, like all we 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 collect a lot of data, and as I mentioned earlier, your entrepreneur client base is mm -hmm. significantly more charitably inclined than the broad population. Oh, really? Wow. Uh, like currently entrepreneurs give about 50% more than the civilians. Wow. And our experience, uh, our survey data of successful entrepreneurs is somewhere around 70% of your clients of entrepreneurs 
are contemplating or, or thinking about how to give back to their community using the wealth that they've created in their business. Which the survey data is they want to do this and they need a path, um, which of course tees up, as we've all promised to talk about, um, the a pre-transaction gift of business equity, which is a great path to, as I mentioned earlier, to convert a generous donor into a philanthropist. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're having a hundred million dollar liquidity event, everybody's pretty excited about it until somebody tells them they're going to pay $22 million in capital gains taxes. And then they're a little bit less excited and they start to talk about getting some you know, tax air cover, which dovetails quite nicely with their entrepreneur's propensity for philanthropy. And that's where the advisor can engage early on in those liquidity conversations about how to fund their future in philanthropy and get some tax air cover. And it's a fantastic path into, of course, making sure we know where the assets end up after the liquidity event and the multi-generational values conversation around philanthropy. And that's been, it's a big part of our business. It's a, certainly a growing part of our business. And for the advisor community, it's a terrific opportunity to really get in generationally with their first generation wealth builders and make sure that they're still there for the generations to come. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's, uh, that's a, a great conversation to have. And if it's true, you know, it's statistics, but if it's true that 70% of those people are thinking about a charitable gift associated with the wealth in the business, then clearly their financial advisors need to be asking that. And how should a firm approach that? Like, I, 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 by what I mean is like, let's say you're dealing with an RIA that has never gone into this area with a client. Uh, cause I, again, I think, I think there's lots of firms who are like that. Um, what's a good kind of first step? Because uh, no doubt, maybe to talk about like the elephant in the room, you know, uh, all, all the things we've talked about, I'm sure there's some people sitting there listening, going, oh, this sounds like liability. This sounds like I'm, I'm putting, I'm, uh, I'm getting, a, a, I, I'm getting into risky area. If I recommend like one charity over another or yeah, one family member gets upset because they, you know, all this type of stuff. Like what's, what's a good kind of first step or, or what's a good kind of philosophy that a firm should approach? That's, a, that's again, open for the room as well. I was going to say also, I think, I think that the, the first thing and this sort of, I think dovetails nicely, but it's more of a piggyback onto what Jim was just saying. I, I think that if you can remember particularly if your clients are wealth creators um, and Gen Xers are younger, they don't differentiate between philanthropy and their taxable accounts necessarily. Hmm. Um, they, they want impact no matter what. <laughs> and so they use the term social impact, right? Because grant making is just one kind of the way, one way that they're supporting their charities. They may be volunteering, um, they may be investing um, in companies based on certain screens. So I don't think you have to be an expert in philanthropy or an expert in impact investing because there are experts that, that are actually designed to serve firms like yours. Um, but so I think the first starting point though is just recognizing they don't differentiate. And so the best conversation that you can have, the best way to start the conversation is to find out what's important to them, right? And so that's gonna, then you can apply it across the board, right? To their investments in their brokerage account, to their donor advised fund, to their private foundation. So, and it also is a less daunting prospect to say, what'd you do over the weekend? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, where do you volunteer? You know, and you can even bring your own personal experience in. Like I volunteer at my kid's school. That's my favorite place to volunteer. How old are your kids? You know, it's, can, it's a really nice way to understand them better um, in general. And so I think, and it also, it just seems like an easier conversation because really you're just getting to know them 
Um, and that's a critical piece of the trusted advisor role is to really, you know, and we want to help you for, when we want to kind of push away all of the noise so that you can have that meaningful values conversation. And then the rest of it kind of falls into place. I, to your point about the fear of, you know, recommending a charity, like I have that fear too. <laughs> like, I don't want to tell a donor where to give necessarily because that represents, that represents a reputational risk to my company, to me. Um, so instead I share stories of my own philanthropy in hopes that they will share stories of theirs. I also don't think necessarily, and I could be speaking out of turn because you know your clients best, that they necessarily expect you to tell them where to give. Again, there are resources like Jim has talked about and like we've been talking about that can help you help, help them <laughs> decide where to give. I don't necessarily think you have to take it that far. And I don't know, I don't know that that's the expectation of the client either. I agree. And, and it just reinforces like, if you're not talking to the client about this, somebody else is. To, Jim, to Jim's point about, you know, what was it, 70%? uh of people that kind of think what having this desire and, and this want right. um somebody is talking to them sharia anything to add in in terms of best practices around this i mean this was this was great i i think uh, jim and julie you, you you said it all uh, it is just about getting to know them getting to know their values and not making it about products or charities it's what's yeah. important to them and it doesn't even have to be a financial product it, it it can be their their time that they're volunteering just what are they all about and so shari maybe you can take the next one which is you know around about how do you make this really integrated into the financial planning process for a firm like the uh, making the kind of charitable planning and, and financial planning process really kind of integrated because again kind of comparing dynasty network firms against the rest of the industry i would argue and i'd say probably dynasty network firms are 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 more kind of deep do really go deep on the financial planning aspect of it any kind of best practices in terms of integrating that I think to just make it part of the normal planning conversation. So whether that's, you know, after tax time and there, you know, there's a there's a tax reason to bring it up or throughout the year, if they did establish a donor advised fund, you know, see how it's going. Um, but it just goes back to the overall planning, the overall legacy planning, bringing in the family and getting to know them throughout the year. I mean, I think that's it. Okay, excellent. We do have one question in from the audience, uh, and it's a good like housekeeping question, is around minimum investment sizes for donor advised funds. Can we just go quickly around the group just to say like, what minimums are you seeing on, on your platforms? We can start with uh, Sharia, then sure. Julia, and then Jim. So with the three that we're working with, um, American Endowment is 25,000, Renaissance is 10,000, and uh, BNY Mellon Charitable Gift Fund is 10. Excellent. Julia? Um, we don't have a minimum to set up an account, so um, which is nice for young kids. They can be funded potentially from a parent account. Um, so no minimum to set up an account. Um, minimum for professional management is 250,000. Then you're no longer limited to the 15 investment pools that we offer. We like to see advisors link to the account regardless of the investment program um, because you can transact, you can recommend grants on behalf of your client from the account regardless of, regardless of its size. But at 250,000 and above, you can then begin to introduce ETFs, individual equities, separately managed accounts and private alternatives. Excellent. All right, it'll come as no surprise that the, the Fidelity program looks significantly like the Schwab program. And so we have no minimum account size. We do have an annual minimum $100 fee. So if your account's $1,000, the fee's going to be a little stiff. So you'll want to grant it back to zero before the fee hits. And uh, so it, we have no minimum account size. There's 25 investment choices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At 250 as I mentioned earlier, we expect the donor to advise us to hire mm -hmm. the dynasty team to manage the funds. And then, then you're off and running um, with uh, relatively easy restrictions on what you can own in the account. And then you get to alternatives, as Julie mentioned, you get to alternatives depending on the liquidity requirements and minimum uh, contribution requirements for whatever your alt sponsor is. So Excellent. 
do that. So you can manage all the way up on that. And, you know, so here at Fidelity Charitable, just, you know, our minimum, our smallest account is, of course, is zero. And our largest account is a couple billion dollars. So, you know, it really runs the gamut of not the size of the dollar amount for mm -hmm. the client in this conversation, but the charitable intent of the donor and the donor's family for what's going to be the appropriate vehicle or combination of vehicles to get their philanthropy done. And that okay. just made me think of something else, which is that some of these accounts, Jim mentioned they have zero balance accounts. Some of these accounts are not even funded during the lifetime of the donor. Um, so your clients can set up a donor advised fund as a repository for retirement assets or trust assets if they're not ready to part with the asset during their lifetime. So many of our zero balance accounts are sitting and waiting uh, for bequests. Excellent, excellent. Guys, thank you so much. Sharia, Julia, Jim, this has been excellent. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but we're really appreciative to you, you guys and, and the three organizations uh, that you guys represent. Uh, I, as mentioned, we're going to be sending through following today a kind of resource pack that's going to have information from your three organizations. Um, really, and, and that will be kind of contact details if any of the advisors um, have any questions uh, to follow up from. But as you can tell here, there's lots of resources here. So, uh, Unfortunately, we have just scratched the surface on this, but it just shows that the level of resources available. Jim, Julia, Sherry, thank you so much and hope thank to see you. you again soon. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Take care, guys.